I've already had a wonderful interaction, so I'm not going to say much more. That was it. I work in the V8 team, and I, essentially, I'm mostly a compiler engineer. I started as a JavaScript editor, and now I like a full stack developer. I, I'm a generalist. I do a lot of things. Now, adjust your expectations from this talk. Uh, I'm not a UI or UX designer, which means I'll not show you something beautiful or new ways to interact with UIs in 3D. It's not my job. I'm a software engineer, not a designer. What I will show you is to build UIs usable in a 3D world, which is a technical feat right now. So this is what is going to happen. And with some solid engineering principles, because anybody can hack something, but then you should try to actually make it work and maintainable, so we should try to understand how this could be done. Now, why am I doing this talk at all? And, uh, okay, virtual reality is all the rage, it's sexy. That could be a reason, but not really. This starts from a real need in my day job. And uh, Hyperfair is the company where I work. We do virtual trade shows on the web and uh, virtual showrooms. And, well, seeing it is actually easier. So, essentially, this is our product, is what we give to our customers. It's like a, a multiplayer game online, and it has a UI, you see? This is a UI. You can pick places to go, you can then actually go there. This is like a virtual exhibition. You, you know exhibitions where you can go online. In principle, there should be other avatars interacting with mine, and then, uh, you know, I could uh, chat, uh, and do things. Uh, so as you can see, this is a, a system that is in 3D, and we've been doing this by the, since 2011 with customers. So we are a bit early in this market. Now, it has a UI, because you've seen there were windows, buttons, lists, things to manipulate for a user. And now we are transitioning this thing to VR. So it was 3D on the web, it is 3D on the web, and you want this thing to be usable with an Oculus, a cardboard, a Daydream, uh, you know, VR. And the, the problem is we, have, we are having is we need the UI in VR too. So we have things that our users are doing with the product, and when they take their Oculus and put them in front of their head, they should be able to do it, so we should show them the same thing as before. Now, Technology issue. Now, we are based on Unity 3D, and so is our UI, which means that our technical problems are of a certain kind. But what if we wanted to use proper web technologies? So right now, picture that kind of piece of software done with real web technologies. And now, I have a dream. The dream is of a world where developers can be 3D UIs on the web, in virtual reality worlds, using the same technology and tools they use every day. Now, the problem with this dream is the 1090 rule. So every project that is visionary is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And uh, I'm sorry for you, in this talk, the inspirational part is over. Now, it's all about doing the dirty job and actually solving silly technical issues that are due to the technologies that we use. So let's build this UI. And on the web, usually, UI means DOM. So as front-end developers, when you do a UI, you essentially manipulate the DOM, usually with a framework on top. But in the end, it's the DOM. Now, VR on the web means WebGL, a WebGL canvas in 3D mode, of course. And usually, of course, with a framework on top, be it 3JS or Babylon or whatever, but that's it. Now, could I have... DOM over WebGL, because that would solve the issue. I, I make my UI with the DOM, and I can see it in the 3D world. And life is hard on us. This is essentially not going to happen. So, uh, technically, we have uh, CSS3 transforms. So we could build a UI in a div in the DOM, and then place this UI with a 3D transform in the 3D world. But this is not really going to work because they don't integrate with the Z buffer, which means uh, when you give them some depth and you put them in the world, the, they are not to be partially covered by an object in the world. 
trying to do that thing will be really, really tricky. It's possible, but it's so tricky that it's just not worth it. Uh, so essentially what you still have is a canvas and a div. Either the div is over the canvas or it's behind the canvas. The div is not inside the 3D world with the 3D CSS transform. So th this doesn't work. Now, could I just render the DOM in a canvas context? And, okay, technically there's a way. You could take your DOM, make a big string out of it, and put that inside SVG. And an SVG engine will actually render that DOM. But it's almost a joke, and then there are security issues. Uh, resource sharing gets in the way, and the security issues are really, really non-trivial. Browser vendors have toyed with the idea, and they said, we are not going to do it until we solve the security issues, which will be I don't know when. Why? Because if you do, then you have to think like this. If you've got pieces of JavaScript coming from different uh, domains, one of them will essentially see the screen that has been rendered by the other. And this is against the segregation principles that we have for security in JavaScript. So uh, this is a security nightmare, because while, once you have a shader running in the GPU, the shader has essentially access to the video memory. So um, it's hard. OK, I say I don't give up. I want this UI done. Are there other options? What, what can you do to do this? Well, we can give up the DOM. We say, OK, I cannot use the DOM and put that inside the 3D context. Let's use something else. We should render a UI directly inside the WebGL canvas. But then I said, well, not so fast. Because the, the WebGL canvas is a 3D context. And usually, we want our UI in 2D. Now, I, I'll talk about this for a while. Believe me, you really do want it. Because it's true that we are going VR, and everything will be the 3D world, uh, 3D objects flying everywhere. But what if you... Sh OK, think about our example, virtual trade shows. Two, two men meet each other. I want to give you my business card. Now, the, the business card. Uh, I, am I going to assemble a business card out of 3D objects? Does it make any sense? Uh, in my opinion, a business card is a flat thing where, where there's written something, written something else, a picture of something, a logo of something. So this, this is the thing that I want to put inside the 3D world. So if I have a list of something, a description of a product or something like that, in the end, I want it flat. So uh, yes, we could imagine ways to interact in 3D, but in the end, all the 2D things that we do on the web now should be brought inside the virtual world in some way, because we will want them one way or another. So, well, the idea. The idea is just to render the UI in a 2D canvas, and then use this 2D canvas as a texture inside an object in the 3D canvas. What does it mean? Uh, how, uh, is there somebody that doesn't know what a texture is? So everybody knows what a texture is. Wonderful. Uh, essentially, it means I have my 2D canvas. I write the, the GUI inside that. I have a 3D object. And I use this canvas as a kind of skin around the object to, vid, to give it the, the color, so that, in fact, I have the UI projected inside the 3D object. OK, I said render the UI. So now I, I started thinking I want the DOM. I want to use the usual technology. But then I ended up saying, oh, I have to render the UI pixel by pixel in a canvas. Which framework am I going to use? Am I going to write all the pixels with the JavaScript functions one by one? I'm not, I don't think I'm going to finish so soon. OK, what I want to do is to use a framework that we are used to. Because think about it. We are going virtual reality. But very likely, the, the, the product that we will do will still live in the normal web. So we we'll still have to maintain the normal 2D UI. What do I want to do? Rewrite the, the, the whole code of my product? Or will, will I want to actually share code? And how much, share, how much code can I share? Will the paradigm, the framework, be so different or almost the same? And my idea is to pick React. Why React? 
Well, in React, okay, disclaimer, I love React a lot. I, I like a lot of things about React. And in general, of the, those kind of purely functional frameworks when uh, the, the view is a pure function of a model. So even cycle, thanks, Andre, and so on. So it, it's easy to separate the, let's call it business logic, so the application logic, from the view code when you have a framework like this. And most of all, these are naturally DOM independent. So you have the view is a pure function of your object model, of your state. It's a pure function that emits something. It can emit DOM or manipulate DOM, or it could emit or manipulate canvas data. Uh, which means if you go this way, you can have your software structured in a pretty solid way, not, don't do anything crazy, and essentially you only have to re-implement the view, which for me is sort of okay. Uh, this is something that I, I can accept. Now, let's pick actually a sample application so that we, we are talking about something concrete. And the application is the ubiquitous to-do list because, well, everybody does a demo with a to-do list. It's very, very simplified because I just wanted to do a proof of concept, so it's not a traditional full to-do application. And for this implementation of, as a proof of concept, I built the logic in Redux style. Uh, which means uh, there is an immutable state. Uh, every time something happens, I get a new version of the state. And uh, through the view, I can emit events, actions, call them whatever you like, that m make so that the system switches to the next state. And then uh, when the, the system switches state, it triggers a re-render of the view. This is the gist of Redux in a few words. And this way, we'll be able to reuse the logic in the 3D UI. So we'll use the logic in the 2D UI and in the 3D one. It will be just the same. We are not going to touch any line of code about that. So let's see how, how it looks. It looks something like, um, okay. This, where was it, where was it, where was it? Okay. Essentially, I have a small function that builds the state, which has the next available ID for to-dos, the, the current text that I'm writing, the list of the to-dos, and the amount of scrolling. We'll see now why. I can build the initial state. I can build a to-do. And then I have a few functions that do actions. They add the current to-do, toggle the state of the current to-do, and every function essentially returns the result of build state, so gives me the new build state, the, the new build state. This is a very, very small piece of code. In the end, I export all these functions. They are pure functions. If I invoke them, the things happen. So very, very simple. And then what I can do is I, I create, the, I, I'm using the Redux vocabulary. So I'm, I'm creating a dispatcher, which is a function that starts with an initial state, and every time I dispatch an action, I have this action with arguments, and I invoke it, get the new state, and if it is different from the state, I change it, and I call this state handler. State handler will be the thing that will trigger the re-render of the view. So the idea is, this file is the whole logic of the to-do application. This is the thing that I have written. It's my ap application logic. It doesn't change. And every time it does something, it can signal the view, hey, the state changed. Show, show this to, to, to the user. Do, do whatever magic you want. If it's React, it will call set state. That will trigger render. That, that's uh, the way it works. OK. So this is just the logic file. And with this logic file, we can have a DOM view, which just look from the size of the file. It, it, it's very small. A and in the end, it's usual React code. So uh, here I have the to-do element, and I emit a few divs. And there is an on-click to do the toggle on, on a button. And um, so it's, it's just a small piece of React code. And here, what's OK? And here I have the view with the DOM. 
which is what we expect. So I have uh, one to do, another to do, another to do. I can toggle them. And uh, once I have toggled a few, I can uh, remove them. So pretty straightforward. That's it. Now, this is the implementation I did as a proof of concept just to have a UI working. And then I could say, OK, let's see what can we do on the canvas about this. And I said, what about a canvas drawing framework with React bindings? Because this is what I'm really after. In the end, I decided that my architecture was React. So what I need is something that when I want to do render, actually writes to a canvas. Am I going to rewrite this thing, or am I going to reuse something that's there? And well, here we have JavaScript fatigue that is hitting us, because as usual in this ecosystem, there's always too many frameworks, too much choice. And choice is good, but it's also hard. But we must be honest, it's always better having choice than starting from scratch. If I had to start from scratch, this would have been very hard. The top choices of framework that I looked at were one was React Canvas. There's a company that did exactly this, a UI on Canvas. That would have been the perfect match. Unfortunately, they stopped supporting the library, of course. And uh, it was tied to older versions of React. I looked at the code. Trying to do the, the porting and the maintenance was non-trivial. Uh, they explicitly said in the, in the issue tracker, we are not going to do it, uh, we don't have time, uh, and it's non-trivial. And if it's non-trivial for those that wrote it, I, I said, OK, mm, I don't have the time. There's Pixie.js. It's a wonderful library that handles uh, the canvas, and it has React bindings. And there is Conva.js, which is another nice library. The, the, the thing that they have in common is that they have a real object model. So what they do these libraries is they have objects when you can make trees of objects, like the DOM is a tree, you know. And essentially, when you manipulate the tree, so you mutate the tree, they update the canvas. So they are the perfect, fi perfect fit for a React binding, because what you do with React is manipulate their tree. So it's, it's a very layered approach, but it's just the same as the DOM one. And uh, I say, pick your poison, in the sense that you must really make this choice wisely. Because you live with this poison, the, 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 the library that you choose for longer than you think. So in the end, what, what I'm trying to say is, when you do a choice like this, this choice has very big consequences. You are tying yourself to a library, and then it's very difficult to undo the choice. And if you pick the wrong one for whatever reasons, you will have to suffer with it for a while. In the end, I pick at Conva. Mostly, 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 because its React wrapper is very, very simple. Now, Conva is uh, this. So it's a project. You see it. It, has, it is maintained. It is nice. I also talked to the maintainer. And this is a canvas. It gives you manipulation of things on the canvas. And what's important, there is this other project that is React Conva, which is the, the React binding to Conva. So, and the nice thing about this thing is that it's essentially one single file. It's very, very small and uh, very understandable. So it's something that I could understand in one, one evening, essentially. So that was, I said, at least let's start with something that I can manage. Then what I did was to add CSS layout to it. This is another tricky issue. If you are thinking canvas, you are thinking, I draw something on the screen. And usually, when you think canvas, you think absolute positioning. But when you think UI, you think about something that has a structure, a logical structure. And you want to position things according to the logical structure. You don't want to do all the calculation by hand. You want a framework to actually do the layout of the UI for you. Now we have CSS on the DOM. We take this for granted. We might hate it. It may be I hate it. Uh, but in the end, it gets the job done. Without that, the layout would be a horrible mess. And the CSS layout is a project that Facebook did, which re-implements the Flexbox model in JavaScript. 
And they use it in React Native and other things there, so it's recompilable to the C language and other things, but I just needed it because it was pure JavaScript. And uh, what I did is I took the Conva object model, which didn't have a layout engine, and I added this thing to that tree so that I could lay out the elements of the tree using CSS, uh, essentially without having to write anything. I even did a pull request to the project for this. But it's code a bit hard to understand. So he said, oh, cool, I look at that. And then he didn't look at that. So let, let's see what happens. And let's see what actually happened. And to show you what happened, I want to start from as an older version of the code. So at, at some point, I wanted the thing to take some shape. And this is the same thing as before, but now here we also have a canvas. So when I, when I add a to-do, you can see, OK. Now, it's, it's starting to look funny. But what's really important is that I have one view here with DOM. And this thing is a 2D canvas. And it is synchronized with the DOM because the logic is running only once. There's only one instance of this dispatcher that holds the state. And I am essentially have, I have two views on this page. They are both synchronized to the same thing. Now, here it looks horrible because the first thing they did was just to implement uh, the, the integration with CSS so, so that I could, I could lay out things. Then I wanted to make them let's say, beautiful in the sense, let's give them borders, let's make them uh, more readable, and so on. And so what I really, really ended up doing in the end is this. So you, you have your objects here, your to-dos, and uh, you, you can uh, scroll them, and you see that they are synchronized. You can uh, pick them from here and remove them from here, or pick them from sorry, the button is here, and remove them from here. And, and you can even write here. Now, you see that the text box is not focused, that there's no cursor in. I am intercepting the keyboard events in the canvas. And I had to implement the text editing logic myself. This is another problem. Uh, at this point, you simply have no framework. You are doing everything on your own. Uh, it's sort of doable, manageable, but th these are problems that need to be solved in some way. But anyway, the nice thing is that it's here. It works. Uh, we have uh, a DOM view and we have uh, a canvas view, and uh, they are in sync, which was what we wanted. Now, as usual, the devil is in the details. So there are a, a, a lot of issues with this thing. One is that CSS layout is not enough. So I started Optimist, and I said, oh, I take this CSS JavaScript library, and I integrated it with Conva, and then I have all the layout for free. And uh, well, yes, if Flex is enough. <coughs> Sorry. Problem is, Conva is very, very poor in the sense that it has, it is very, it has very low-level primitives, particularly if I want something like this, which is a, a rectangle with borders and text and something, you have to superimpose them yourself. So you end up with uh, uh, with code like okay, panel row is, is the culprit. OK, you end up with code that is a, a React component that essentially makes a group that contains a rectangle that then contains another group that contains the children. And all this stuff, simply to have something that with CSS, normally, you have a div, and you set the style with the correct border. I didn't notice that Conva was so limited in this sense, because, I, OK, I was a bit in a hurry. And then I, I had a problem, because to have something so simple as set a border to something, I had to build this kind of component. And the funky thing is, 
the, the, re the rectangle with the, the content and the content need to be totally superimposed. They are one above the other. And the Flexbox model is not going to do this. So I had a, a CSS integration that was only doing one model of CSS, and I also needed the others. So I, I ended up hacking the code to have multiple layout ways of doing things so that I could either base, do something, say, in absolute ways or relative to the parent, or inject the CSS engine onto that so that it would do the layout. And it became so, well, the code was not clean anymore. Then propagate, propagating size info in the layout thing became cumbersome. Because at some point, I was using the CSS implementation, and in other points, I was doing the layout myself. So the, the, the propagation of the values started becoming crazy. And mixing these, these layouts became crazy. And then CSS layout does not always do what you think it should do. This is a problem with CSS by itself. So. And then there was a problem with event handling. So uh, <coughs> Conva has its own event handling engine. So there are mouse events, and they can hit uh, things on the screen. So if you do a mouse over on a rectangle, it, that object gets the event. And if you do a mouse over on a rather, another rectangle, that is getting the events. But uh, the filtering uh, is a bit gross. So uh, sometimes I had to turn, do, do, do things, strange things to get it done. And then it does not handle keyboard events at all, the way I saw it, because it doesn't need it. Usually, there's the, the focus issues. You don't have it on a canvas. You just get everything. And so I, I had to actually put an event handler manually on the page to get the keyboard events. So this, something that, in principle, had to be clean ended up being way, way dirtier than, than what I actually wanted. Now, we solved these issues, okay, but now we have a 2D UI inside a canvas, and we still need to show it in 3D, because the whole point was to have it in 3D. So let's build a 3D scene. And uh, it turns out that you can actually build a 3D scene. I I'll show you the code first this time. I pick at Babylon as an engine. <coughs> and so I have this React component, which in the end, all it does is put a canvas on the screen. And I have a ref that takes this canvas. And when I have the canvas, I can actually take, essentially, create the, the scene, so instantiate the 3D engine, and work on it, and create a camera, create a light, uh, all the skybox, all those funky 3D things that one does normally. And the, the end result is that I can have this. And this is sort of what I wanted. So it is exactly this canvas. Notice one thing. If I pass above this button, it gets the highlight. The other view doesn't get it. If I pass above this one, both do get the highlight, because in this case, what happened is that it's physically the same canvas. I only have one 2D canvas in this DOM tree. And I'm showing it inside this div, and I am using it as a texture for an object here. So this is a 3D object, definitely, in a 3D space as you can see. There's a satellite orbiting so that you can be sure that it's really 3D. <laughs> and uh, this is essentially the idea. But as you, as you saw, it's the same UI, the same logic, the same code, everything. Uh, only it's been projected in 3D. Now, and then we did it. What happened is uh, yet more issues. So mapping events. Mapping events started out being way, way trickier than what I was imagining. In principle, it's simple. In practice, you end up with uh, So when I do a mouse move, at each mouse move, what happens is that a ray has, is casted in the camera space 
uh, and uh, in the camera space because this is a 3D camera. So a mouse move is in 2D. It points to a pixel. And this pixel is logically a direction in 3D space. So you need to, to create a ray that starts from the origin of the camera to the pixel rendered at, that, at those coordinates. Now, you have that ray. You have to use this ray to do a 3D object intersection to find if it hits something. Now, when it hits here, it is hitting the 3D object that has the UI. You who? And then? And then you have to do something even more funky, because at that point, you have a point in 3D space. But what you need really to do is to convert this point in 3D space into a point in 2D space in the 2D coordinates of this surface. Luckily, the engine came into help. So you just need to call the correct methods of the engine. And in the end, what you end up with are the coordinates in texture space which are okay. So in texture space, th this is a texture, so I get the pixel of the texture that got the event. Then what I need to do is to take these two coordinates, go back to Conva. So I have to pierce my uh, React abstraction over Conva, take the Conva object, and invoke a method onto the, the Conva layer that asks Conva, hey, guy, I've got a point in the canvas. Because at that point, it's in 2D space, it's in the canvas. Please tell me if there is any shape under this point. And then Conva will actually tell me something like, oh, there is this rectangle. It's your object. And then what I do is in the React, so what I do is to tell Convas, OK, make this object emit an event. And then in the, on the React side, I listen to those events which means that the machinery is sort of cumbersome, but once you've done it, it can propagate events, and then it becomes okay, because in the end, in your code, you just do something like this. I have a rectangle, and I have these events, pointer moves 3D, pointer pick 3D. So these events are synthetic events. They are the events generated by my code. And I listen to them, and essentially, I emit these ones. It looks a bit funky, but in the end, it, 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 does, it gets the job done. And then you also have this thing, on mouse down, on mouse up, on mouse move. So these events are the normal DOM events that I get when I am in this space. When I am in this space, uh, the canvas is emitting uh, DOM events, and using React, I can catch them. But when I am in that other space, what I get are the synthetic events that I am emitting. In principle, I could have synthesized mouse events. But to do it in the proper way, I would have needed to fake the client x, y coordinate, screen x, y coordinate, local x, y, client, you, you, you know, all those coordinates. Because a synthetic event to be handled by a normal event handler needs to look real. And I didn't feel like <coughs> taking the time to actually generate synthetic events that looked real enough so that the event handlers would actually pick them and do the right thing. So I decided to go this strange mixed way. So my React component is reacting to both the DOM events and the synthetic events. Now, when I am here, essentially, the, the real DOM events are emitted. When I am here, the DOM events go to the 3D canvas, which does the intersection to the 3D shape, finds the 2D coordinates in the 3D shape, invokes Conva, and so on and so on, and then I emit the synthetic one, which has the same semantics and the same local coordinates, so I can just use it. So as I was saying, Mapping events is tricky. And uh, then something crazy happened. Babylon events, so the 3D engine events, and set state invocations on React were, were doing horrible things. I don't know why, but essentially, after I did set state, if I did set state inside the event handler, somehow Babylon got crazy and re-emitted the event handler immediately without even relinquishing control. So I essentially was blocking the JavaScript engine, the page was frozen, and the, uh, the same event was emitted all over again. 
which is something that you say, why? I don't know why. I would need to debug Babylon to know. So when you do things like this, expect stupid issues to pop up because the technology is tricky. How do they solve this? Well, I solved this simply doing totally async uh, UI rendering, which is something that you could do anyway and should do anyway. So essentially what I do is the, the dispatcher does the, the job and it builds the new state. And what the state handler does is store the new state and do a request animation frame. And in the request animation frame, which is totally asynchronous and has nothing to do with event handling, so no event handler is running there, in the request animation frame, I compare the states and I say, oh, if I really have a new state, then I do the React set state. So I somehow managed to decouple the Babylon event handler from the React set state. They were not fighting each other anymore and the, the, this thing is working. So why am I describing this to you? Just to say things that look simple on the surface, the, the devil is always in the details. Okay, this is the solution that I picked. And did I say that mapping events were tricky? It, it, it was, seriously. Now it works, but about VR, what about virtual reality? We started saying, I want this in VR. I was toying with the idea to do a VR demo of some kind, but it's okay. I let the other speaker, the one after me, do a good job at this because I'm sure she will. And what I did was just this. In the Babylon thing, what I can say is that instead of this camera, I can create this camera, which is a web VR camera. And uh, probably, if everything goes well, we still have the same, system, the same system as before. But now, we have stereo rendering. So we are in VR. And it's the same thing as before. I mean, it's really the same. So it's handling things, events, you know. So future ideas. Uh, real 3D UIs. One could do a UI done with real 3D objects. Sometimes it should be nice. And uh, what the, after, so after what I learned doing this experiment, what I would probably do is to make a unified framework with React bindings or Cycle.js bindings, I'm starting to like it, um, on Babylon 3D objects, and uh, Babylon is a thing called Canvas 2D. It's logically equivalent to Conva. So it's, again, a library that does 2D drawing, and they, they, they were meant exactly to the UIs. It has a lot of small limitations, but the nice thing is that the event handling is totally integrated. So since it's all Babylon, uh, it's like 3JS Babylon, only a bit more comprehensive. Uh, so, at this point, I would expect the event handling to be natural. And uh, I would just need to fix clipping and uh, the layout engine, I would need to add it. But the nice thing about Canvas 2D is that I discovered it has a layout engine of its own, which does either absolute or uh, stacking. I would just need to create a new layout manager with flex, and then I would have a layout system with absolute stacking and flex. So that would be pretty usable. And then there, there would be the canvas to the text, or this is a technical thing, it's too, too long to explain. So the takeaway from this talk is that this proof of concept works. This is something that can be done. If one is persistent and overcomes all the issues, you can do it. It's not production ready, of course, but it gets the job done. Production ready means about what you really need. If your application is this simple, it's ready. If it's more complex, there's more work to do. But in the end, this code at this point works. And with current frameworks, it's harder than what I had imagined. It. This, I wouldn't imagine all these silly complications. But with some effort, it can maybe be beautiful from the developer point of view, because all these issues that I got can be fixed at the framework level. So once you abstract the event handling, the clipping, the layout, and everything, and you find a nice API for yourself to do it, then you've got a framework that actually works uniformly 
on the DOM and in 3D and in VR. So it's, it's something that has a value. If anybody of you will work on VR, just do like this, in my opinion, it will work. So that's all, folks. That was. Is React a re... Is, well, start again. Time for one question. Is React really a good abstraction for this problem? Is it cumbersome just because of the lack of libraries? Is it cumbersome just because of? OK, for me, uh, the really good abstraction to this problem is uh, the fact that it's purely functional. It could be React or another of the React-like frameworks, as long as they are DOM independent, which essentially all of them are. The lack of libraries, well, as far as I know, there were these React bindings for uh, Canvas drawing libraries. I am not aware of any library for the other frameworks. So in this sense, let's say the momentum of React and the fact that it is so popular makes it a good fit. Now, perhaps with a less cumbersome framework, doing the binding yourself would be less expensive. I was seriously, after this day of conference, toying with the idea of exploring more Cycle.js, because maybe uh, making a backend for Cycle.js is easier than making a backend for, for React. This is a different issue. So. Excellent, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Massimiliano Mantione. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>